The last page has been turned on my most recent read. Well, actually, that isn't quite true this time. As I write the beginning of this, I still have quite a few chapters to go. But my thoughts are fully formed, and though I don't quite know right this minute how the book is going to end, I know how I feel about where it's been. All that being said, here I am, no spoilers, as opinion-filled as ever and ready to roll. All of which means it's time for the latest episode of Being Bookish. Join me today as I follow a group of rebels planning a very dangerous heist. We have vampires, secrets, and maybe a romance for the ages as I go to Atenia with Arthi, Jin, Flick, Matteo, and Laith for Hafsa, Faisal's A Tempest of Tea. I'm your host, Ray, self confessed bookworm, introvert, hermit, and long term depression sufferer. Join me on my journey through my ever growing to be read pile and enjoy the latest of my 100% spoiler free book reviews. This book has, and I sort of cringe as I admit this, been on my ARC bookshelf since last October. Did I have plans to read it before now? Absolutely, but life and other books sort of got in the way. So here I am, just a few weeks after the official publication date, opening up my stunning proof and settling into a new world of revenge, intrigue, and romance with the promise that this book was written for people like me, those who absolutely loved Lee Bardugo's Six of Crows. On the streets of White Roaring, Arthi Casimir is a criminal mastermind and collector of secrets. Her prestigious tea room transforms into an illegal bloodhouse by dark, catering to the vampires feared by the community. But when her establishment is threatened, Arthi is forced to strike an unlikely deal with an alluring adversary to save it, and she can't do the job alone. Calling upon a band of misfits, Arthi formulates a plan to infiltrate the dark and glittering vampire society known as the Atherium. But not every member of her crew is on her side, and as the truth behind the heist unfolds, Arthi finds herself in the midst of a conspiracy that will threaten the world as she knows it. Dark, action-packed and swoon-worthy, this is Hafsa Faisal, better than ever. The book begins in the town of White Roaring in Atenia, a town that is under constant restrictions and ruled with the iron fist of the mysterious but powerful Ram, a creature who hides behind a mask and a secret identity. Arthi Casimir is an intelligent young woman who runs a tea room, Spindrift, with her brother Jin, but this is no ordinary tea room as well as serving the most fragrant teas and delicate pastries to customers who are willing to be to risk being seen at a venue that has a questionable reputation, it is a front for a venue where the vampires of the town can gather to drink blood. There is something brewing under the surface in White Roaring, and Arthi knows it, but right now she has more important things to deal with, namely the mysterious person who has purchased her home out from under her, Spindrift means the world to her, and even more to Jin, who depends on the feeling of security and safety it gives him. All is going well, and relatively normally, well, as normal as it can, when the strange guard Laith shows up on Arthi's doorstep and offers her a bargain. He has a job for her, a heist he knows she can help him to carry out. He wants to break into the Atherium, where many of the more wealthy and powerful vampires make their base. Reluctant at first, Arthi is quickly persuaded by this unusual man, who obviously has an ulterior motive for choosing her, especially when he is charged with serving the ram and ensuring that their wishes are carried out and rules are adhered to. Knowing that she cannot carry this plan out alone, she recruits a small but skilled team, though the persuasion of one reluctant member is left to her charming and enigmatic brother. There's Matteo, the seductive vampire, who is incredibly obvious in his lustful feelings towards Arthi. And then there is Felicity, better known as Flick, a skilled forger and daughter of the head of the EJC, or East Jeevant Company. 
with so many secrets bubbling under the surface, some that Arthi can't even bring herself to admit. Does the heist have a chance of succeeding? Will they manage to get the ledger they're breaking in for, or will someone tear everything apart and watch it crumble? In just two weeks, it will be Easter. The clocks will be going forward and spring will have properly sprung. OK, the last bit I am a little more doubtful about. Keep my fingers crossed firmly. But as I stare out the window at another day of rain, who knows what will change between now and then. There's still 14 days to go. All of that said, it's been a pretty good month. I have read some good and not so good books. I've enjoyed a meal out with friends and a pretty successful meeting at work. All in all, March has been a month of purpose. My reading hasn't picked up. Well, it, it kind of has, but not in the way that I have been reading loads more novels. In fact, if anything, March has been a little quieter. It has been more quality and less quantity, which I personally think is a good thing in many ways. For the last few years, I have promised myself that I would do my best to not only step into new worlds with genres I don't tend to pick up, but also read books by authors I have never attempted before. Last year, more than half the books I read were by new authors, which was incredible, and I found some new instant favourites. This year, so far, I am sort of keeping up that trend. I have read some new authors, some old favourites, and at some point I will be doing a massive batch of rereads. As a relatively new book, and one by an author I have not read before, I wasn't sure what to expect from A Tempest of Tea, but reading through the reviews it appears that feelings are certainly mixed. Though I am still a little way from the end of the book right at this moment, and I often state how much I don't like spoilers, especially when it comes to books, I am going to risk it for you guys. I'm going in, and hopefully I won't find too many that absolutely destroy the ending of the story for me. I still want to be surprised and shocked, and maybe a tad horrified at a revelation or a twist, even if I am expecting one to happen, because they tend to. Despite all that, I do still enjoy reading and leaving reviews, but only after I have read the book in question. So here we are going outside my comfort zone. And I have been known to be incapable of resisting a well-known, well-written review of a book that I actually have no intention of reading ever. When it comes to reviews in general, I do think that they are a very good reflection of how different every reader is and Everything that they like can vary so much. Reading reviews from the top and bottom of the scale helps to create a balance, at least for me. And even if I don't agree with them, or you don't, the fact that they are someone's opinion makes them as valid as yours or someone else's. Everyone is entitled to their own view, and I think it's important to make up your own mind. I guess what I'm trying to say is don't let any of these reviews sway you to change your way of thinking. Books and opinions of them are completely subjective. Mal gave the book one star, finding the biggest issue with the story was the world building. She said, I had high hopes and I tried very hard to like this. I simply couldn't. The problem started with the underdeveloped plot. The world could have been built a little bit better because outside taking the vampire trope, I couldn't see anything original nor interesting in a group of people who loosely don't like each other to finish the job. The world building was done redundantly. There was a lot of description of nothing, really. Nothing that didn't draw me to the story or protagonists. Now, about characters, they are the most bland bunch who are walking trauma with no personality whatsoever. And they are just simply unlikable, especially the main character. There is no purpose in anything she says or does. She just runs her mouth to show everyone how badass she is. The tea house doesn't exist in comparison to Peaky Blinders. And even worse, Six of Crows is non-existent. 
the essence of these two creations was completely lost. Otherwise, we would have had something to talk about. One thing. One, I appreciate, is the anti-colonial themes. If it comes to the audiobook itself, I have never experienced that before. But the narrator sounded like she didn't want this job. She didn't like the book herself and just showed up, did the job, and said bye. It was painful. I couldn't focus for the love of me, and the monotony of the storytelling was a crime against the listener. There is a great responsibility of a narrator to present even the worst story compellingly. This was not it. It's too bad, because I might have even enjoyed it if the production decided to divide voices, or have someone whose those voices would separate. If I find myself wondering constantly who said what, I'm not buying it. When it comes to fantasy, world building is important. It's the issue I had with Divine Rivals and the sequel, and I honestly believe that if a book fails on the world building, then it's one I will struggle to read. Clearly, this is something that Mal agrees with, and looking through the other lower rated reviews that I've been posted on Goodreads, they appear to share her view. Though it saddens me to see someone disappointed in a book, as much as it saddens me when I personally feel the same, the fact that many people voiced these thoughts leads me to believe that they went in expecting something else. On Goodreads, the overall rating for the book is a sort of average 3.88, just a few points higher than the Agatha Christie I reviewed last week, and considerably lower than the majority of popular fantasy novels I've read and spoken about over the last few months, which, given the amount of anticipation associated with this book, and the number of times I saw enthusiastic promotion for it, is really disappointing. I'm not going to say that I am surprised at the lack of reviews that are online for A Tempest of Tea, but I will say that given the volume for other fantasy and romanticy novels, it is unexpected. Right now, on Goodreads, there are 3,891 ratings and 1,741 full reviews, which, though a relatively low number, still gives me a pretty good pool to choose from. The vast majority of those reviews, 67% or 2,647 readers, gave the book four or five stars, while only 1% or 68 reviewers felt that it was less than impressive and deserving of a one-star review. Billy admitted this was his most anticipated novel of 2024 and really enjoyed it. He said, Book of the Year. A Tempest of Tea has been my most anticipated read, period, since it was announced over two years ago. I had just read Faisal's We Hunt the Flame, so was extremely excited when I heard she was writing about vampires and Arthurian legends and Peaky Blinders, and oh my, it did not disappoint. Easiest five stars I have probably ever given. A Tempest of Tea is an incredibly rich and well-written novel full of intrigue, suspense, and just good ideas. It definitely has its comparisons, but it's still so unique. Arthi is an amazingly well-realised protagonist, everything a YA lead should be, and as for the romance, Faisal knows how to write one. It was great in We Hunt the Flame, and it's even greater here. I suspect this is going to blow up on release, so get ready for a wild ride. Bring on book two. A Tempest of Tea is Hafsa Faisal's third novel and the first in her Blood and Tea series, which sounds intriguing in and of itself. Blood and Tea, not the sort of combination you expect will go together in any cohesive manner. An award winner who has appeared on the Forbes 30 Under 30 and clearly favours the exotic if the characters in this book are any reference. But I'll be talking about that later. One thing that the reviews I have shared prove is that everyone has different views. So what I think is amazing or merely average, someone else could feel very differently about. I guess this is why I believe you have to take every review you read or hear, including this one, with a pinch of salt. Anyway, 
now I've told you about other people's views, let's get down to it. Here are my thoughts on A Tempest of Tea by Hafsa Faisal, completely spoiler-free and 100% honest. Did I like the book? I've literally just finished it, writing this bit. There was a gap. There is nothing like just finishing a book to make a review that much easier to write. For some reason, though I have only just closed the cover, a lot of the details are already drifting from my head, which doesn't bode that well. As I mentioned earlier, this particular arc has been on my shelf since it was kindly gifted to me in a giveaway last October. The book looked really pretty and the wisps of steam from a beautiful china teacup filled with what appeared to be dark scarlet blood was incredibly intriguing, merely hinting at the story within. However, something always came between me and it, whether that was a book for a tour or my own desire to pick up a new book that had just been posted through the letterbox. Either way, it took me a good four and a bit months to get around to picking up A Tempest of Tea. And by the time I did, the publicity on Instagram and X was in full swing and my fairy loot copy is sort of winging its way through the every delivery depot. The book was a rather quick read in comparison with a number of the books I've picked up of late, which was a rather pleasant and surprising relief. Though this is the third book by Faisal and seemingly this one is written in the same universe as her other series, if the place names are anything to go by, this is only the first that I have picked up by her and she is definitely skilled when it comes to her characters. Though I wasn't concerned with Arthi, the main protagonist, I greatly enjoyed getting to know her brother Jin. There is something incredibly familiar about him that initially I couldn't put my finger on. Was he like someone I knew, or was it something else? I will get to that in a minute. This novel relies, as many fantasies do seem to these days, on the concept of a found family, and the group of misfits that gather to carry out the heist in this book is certainly one of those. They all have a single goal, but different reasons for getting there. And here's where I hit my first issue with the book. All of these characters are drawn together because they have a specific purpose, but their motivations are never made completely clear. The story is rather convoluted and complex to the point that it caused me no end of confusion. I kept on having to go back a few pages to figure out if I'd missed something, often only to discover that nothing had been revealed that makes things any clearer. Characters like Arthi, Flick and Matteo had ambiguous backgrounds and Lace, even after the big reveal, felt as though it was missing huge chunks. Quite often as I read through the story, I was perplexed as to why Arthi was getting involved in something that could end in her or any of her cohorts dying. I like reading about a good heist. And mysteries have always intrigued me, but this just felt as though it was too much mystery and not enough resolution. This book was marketed very much to appeal to fans of Six of Crows, and as one myself, I had high hopes for this novel, and I feel a tad deflated. This book is not just for fans of Six of Crows, it is pretty much Six of Crows. Earlier, I mentioned that Jin felt familiar. He is, for me, the best character in this book. He is so charismatic, so enigmatic, that as a reader, I am drawn to him, and I want to know more about him than is revealed throughout the book. I just know that there is more to him and his umbrella than meets the eye. And no, that is not a euphemism. He legitimately has an umbrella that he uses as a pretty nifty weapon but I am not sure why, and we don't ever get to learn its origins. Anyway, less about my fascination with him, and more about why he is so fascinating. He is Kaz Brecker and Jasper Fay merged into one. No, he's not the leader of the Motley crew, but he is the one who has all the swagger that I always associate with Kaz and Jasper, and his fascination for Flick is very Kaz and Inej. Unfortunately, Six of Crows has something that A Tempest of Tea lacks, at least for me. That's a comprehensive world. 
There is a lot of history behind A Tempest of Tea and I just don't feel that the world was built strongly enough to cope with the present, at least on the page. I like to think that the second book, when that arrives, will go into more detail. But as I have said previously about fantasy books that don't have this sort of foundation, by the time the second book is done, it's too late to start providing me with the history that should have been there to start. The book alludes a lot to colonialism and part of me can't help but see the strong connection between the East Jeevant Company and the East India Tea Company and its horrific slave trading with Africa, East and West during the 17th and 18th century. The colonialisation of other countries is mentioned many times by the characters who experienced it or witnessed it happening to friends and family. And this, to a certain extent, gives their resentment of the power-hungry Ram a strong and meaningful background. It's just a shame that it was mentioned and then not exactly glossed over, but almost pushed to the side until it was needed again. Overall, I have to say that the book is well written and I enjoyed many of the characters, but the lack of world building and the somewhat convoluted heist plot that I am still trying to make sense of now I've finished the book reduced my enjoyment. I also found that by the time I finished the book, I had already forgotten a lot of it, which is really sad as this was a book I was looking forward to reading. What surprised me most about the book? There were a couple of times that I found myself surprised by an event that happened, but to reveal those particular things would spoil the huge twists. And though I have been less than, oh my God, about this book, there are some twists that came out of nowhere, which I guess is the point of a twist, and they were cleverly done. They just weren't enough to save this book from the one and done pile for me. This disappoints me because so many people have talked about how much they enjoyed or couldn't wait to read this book. I wish I had been one of them. If you're looking for something like this or you loved this and want something else, then you'll love these. In an interview with Goodreads, Faisal herself has given a pretty good recommendation for books just like this one. Shadow and Bone, the first in the Grishaverse by Lee Bardugo, Personally, if I'm going to recommend a book like this, then I am going to head in the direction of another book in that verse, Six of Crows, because for me, there is nothing like reading about Kaz, Inej and Jesper to get the creative juices flowing. The Crows were an incredible creation, and I wish I could read that book again for the first time, but reading it for the second will have to be enough. Okay, I have to ask, where have the last few weeks vanished to? Next week, I am going to be speaking with YA author F.T. Lukens about their new book, Otherworldly, which is released in the UK on the 2nd of April. I finished that one earlier this week and really enjoyed it. I look forward to speaking with its creator and finding out what inspired the world included within. Definitely a well-written and carefully created world with a magical system that I felt consumed by. If you have read anything by F.T. Lukens and have any questions for them, email me at beingbookishpod at gmail.com and let me know. Though this week has been a really busy one, mostly where work is concerned, I have ended it feeling pretty relaxed and incredibly accomplished. and I'm already halfway through my next book. Next week is looking to be a repeat of this one, but I am looking forward to the challenge and a lot of the new books I will be able to dive into. It's also book club week, so I can't wait to find out what everyone thought of The House in the Cerulean Sea. Did it live up to their expectations? Did they like it as much as I did? Check out my review. And what books are we going to be reading next? This week, I recorded and edited a single review for my new YouTube channel. Are you a subscriber yet? Go on, tell me you are. Have you checked out my content? It was a bit of a mind dump on camera, but I hope that I am articulate enough that my thoughts and feelings came across. 
Don't forget, if you want to hear about new releases and other books I've read and keep up on my reviews, wow, that's a lot, you can sign up for my newsletter on my website, beingbookish.co.uk. The next newsletter will be sent out just after Easter, so keep an eye out if you're subscribed or join up if you aren't. Well, that's it for this week and thank you so much for listening. If you like what you hear, why not share it with your friends and family and please post a star rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or any of the other podcatchers where you might listen. It really helps the podcast reach more people. You can also follow me on Instagram as Being Bookish Pod, on TikTok as Being Bookish Reviews, and I apologise, I really haven't been around there much recently, and on X as Being underscore Bookish. And you can find newer episodes and some book themed shorts on YouTube where I am at Being Bookish Pod or Ray is Bookish. Or you can check out my website for the podcast back catalogue and full written spoiler free book reviews at beingbookish.co.uk. Well, I have a few things left to do before I begin another week at work and I am looking forward to finishing the book I started yesterday and visiting the Regency world with Miss Austin Investigates. So until next time, this is me saying farewell. Thank you.